Good morning. Happy Tuesday to you, ladies. Good morning. Welcome to our Eat into Eternity study today. We are headed into Matthew 16, Mark 8, and then Luke 9. These are where we see similar accounts of different things that are taking place. So that's where we're going to be at today. As you ladies are hopping on, great to see you this morning. Please take a moment to share, like, and subscribe based on the platform that you're, you're on. Hit that like or love button. Thank you for joining us on Facebook and on YouTube. And so let's pray and we'll just dive right into our passages this morning. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for waking us up, for bringing us together. Thank you for all that your word has for us, God, that your word is living and breathing, that it is responding to us as we dive into it. Thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that you have given us. We ask this morning that you lead and guide us. Holy Spirit, speak to me and through me. Help us to know and understand the things that you want us to. Thank you for drawing us to yourself that we can get to know you more. Thank you for leading us into your truth. We open our hearts and minds to you, Lord. We are receptive to your transformation in our life. We thank you for all you have done for us. We give this morning to you and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, ladies, good morning. Okay, so today we are going to go into Mark 16, sorry, Matthew 16, Mark 8, and Luke 9. So let's begin in Matthew 16. Previously, at the end of chapter 15, there was a brief mention of the feeding of the 4,000, but we didn't really get into it last time because I knew we were going to see it again in Mark 8 today. So we will be discussing that further and really looking at the differences of these two different feedings that are happening, the feeding of the 5,000, and now we're learning about the feeding of the 4,000. So we'll pick that up when we get over to Mark. But as we continue on in Matthew 16, so this is after this has just happened, and says the Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. So they are not believing in the miracles that they're already seeing. They want to continually be shown more signs from him. And so he replied, when evening comes, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. He's calling out their spiritual blindness for them not recognizing who he is, that he is the long-awaited Messiah. He is the Son of God. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a miraculous sign, so he's accusing them here, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. What was the sign of Jonah? We've gone over this before, but the sign of Jonah was that Jonah was swallowed by the fish, the great fish or the whale, however you want to think about it, and that he ultimately died there. He went to Sheol, that he was in the belly of the fish for three days, and then God brought him back, spit him out of the fish, and then he went on his way. That is the sign of Jonah. It is a foreshadowing of the death and resurrection of Christ. That is what they are yet to see, and they will see it. And that is the sign of Jonah that he is talking about. It goes on to Jesus warn about wrong teaching. When they crossed the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. This term yeast here is often to refer to sin or to evil, but it says, but they discussed among themselves and said, is it because we didn't bring any bread that he's like talking about yeast? So the disciples are ultimately, we see them be dull <laughs> in many ways. We see them also not getting it a lot of times, and that can give us comfort because we don't always get it either, but we can praise the Lord that he does continue to speak to us and to reveal his word to us, but they don't get it. They didn't bring bread on this journey, even though they just saw Jesus feed a great multitude for the second time. And here they are wondering what he's talking about yeast. Is it because we didn't bring any bread? But that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about spiritual things here. The yeast would have been the sin or the evil of the Pharisees and Sadducees that permeated the people's thinking. And he knows that that's leading the people in the wrong way. He knows that their heart is not with God and that listening to them is going to lead people astray because they have convoluted the original law. They've made it so difficult for someone to follow. 
and they've lost the intent behind it all. And so that's what he's referring to here. So he says, you have little faith. Why are you talking amongst yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it that you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? But be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They're a little bit dense, but then they finally get it. (laughs) Praise the Lord for his patience with us. Just like Phyllis says, nope, we don't always get it. Praise the Lord for his patience. So, Let's take a moment and review, compare and contrast these two feedings and what is Jesus talking about here and why does it matter to him that he's saying, don't you get it? How many basketfuls did you have left over for this one? How many basketfuls did you have left over for this one? Maybe before we do that, let's actually return to the Mark account just to review (laughs) because that was previously in Matthew 15. So let's head over to Mark chapter 8, and we will see some of the differences, and then I have a chart to help us compare. So it says, during those days, another large crowd gathered. Now, we have to remember, Jesus right now is in Gentile territory. That's where he's been. He's been healing all the people in Gentile territory. He healed the Syrophoenician woman's daughter. We just went over that yesterday, and there was that whole exchange about Jewish people and Gentiles being called dogs, and we went over all of that. So he's in Gentile territory, and he's going to do this next feeding of the 4,000. And remember, 4,000 would have only been the men. So you can double or more than double the amount when you consider women and children that were there as well. So it says, since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answers, but where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? How they're not recalling the previous feeding of the 5,000, which we know was much more than that, that they've already witnessed. And yet they're in a similar situation and they're like, where are we going to get bread? It's just interesting that they don't recall and be like, oh, well, Jesus fed the 5,000 last time. Why can't he just do it right now? But anyways, regardless, they're like, where and how are we going to get bread for all these people? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well, and he gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 men were present, and having sent them away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went into the region of Dalmanutha. So let's pause there. And then, oh, actually, I mean, Mark recalls the same thing that Matthew just did. Jesus is saying, be careful, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. So this is down to verse 14. And it says, is it because we have no bread? Here's their discussion again. And Jesus says, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls did you pick up? 12, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls did you pick up? Seven, they said. Do you still not understand? So now let's pause and compare. There's some very interesting things for us to understand as we are looking at these two feedings that were happening. The feeding of the 5,000 versus feeding of the 4,000 that's just happened. There are significant differences that clearly Jesus was upset that they didn't get it. So let's look through and see what we can figure out. First, the feeding of the 5,000 was very Jewish in nature. It was to the Jews. It was primarily a Jewish crowd. It was in the Jewish region of Bethsaida in Galilee. 
There was five loaves, two fishes. There was 12 basketfuls left over. It took place over one day and it happened in the spring. If we compare that to the feeding of the 4,000, this was in the Gentile territory. This is in the region of the Decapolis. There were seven loaves and a few fish, and they had seven basketfuls left over. This took place over three days that the people were with him. And this happened in the summer. What's interesting about this is that we see here the thing that he asked them is how many basketfuls did you have left over? They had 12 basketfuls with the Jewish audience and they had seven basketfuls with the Gentile audience. What does that mean? What can we glean from that? Well, as you begin to study scripture and you begin to realize there are certain numbers that mean certain things throughout scripture. If we look at the number 12, this can often symbolize the kingdom of heaven. 12 was a very, would have been a very Jewish related number. It is, there's 12 tribes. There was 12 apostles. We see the number 12 over and over when it's speaking specifically to the Jewish people. This is symbolic of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is a physical kingdom that Christ will reign from Jerusalem in the millennial reign. This is going to be a supernatural blessing for Israel. We've seen this already in prophetic texts, in Isaiah, in Ezekiel. We'll see it in Revelation. There is going to be where Christ is ruling and reigning over the earth from Israel, from Jerusalem, and there will be a supernatural blessing over that area and over the people. If we look at the number seven, seven is it is the number of completion, the number of wholeness. There were seven days of creation. Seven often is referred to for the kingdom of God. What are the difference of kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God? And I don't want to get into super, super deep theological controversy, but of course, scholars debate this all the time. Some say that they're the same thing, but I think we can see some very distinct differences. The kingdom of God is not just an a Jewish Thing. This is for everyone. This is the kingdom that is a spiritual kingdom, not a physical kingdom. It is a spiritual kingdom that is available to all who believe in Christ. This is going to include Gentiles, all who believe in Christ, and it is available now for everyone who believes. So there is two primary kingdoms that Jesus is referring to here with the 12 and the 7, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. So that can get really intense. You might have already learned or been taught different things, but I just want to encourage you that some just brush this off and say, when we see kingdom of God or we see kingdom of heaven in the scriptures, they are referring to the same thing. They're used interchangeably, but the message is different. And I want to encourage you to do a deeper study about this. I'm going to post a link for... Robert Breaker, I want to encourage you to listen to this YouTube training by this pastor of the cloudchurch.org. It is a YouTube video on the kingdom of heaven versus the kingdom of God. And it's interesting because it ties into what Jesus is referring to here of why do you not get the difference? A Jewish audience, you collected 12 baskets. A Gentile audience, you collected seven baskets. What, what is happening here? So there's so much to dive into. So let me post that for you in the comments so that you guys will have that link and you can look, look more into that on your own. I just encourage you to look into that more on your own. One other thing that I wanted to mention is here when we see that this Gentile feeding happened in the summer, there is one Jewish feast that takes place in the summer. It is the Feast of Pentecost. It is the feast that prophetically speaks to the church as a whole, the giving of the Holy Spirit. Of course, we know that when they were celebrating the Feast of Pentecost is when the first coming down of the Holy Spirit happened. And there are many things within this particular feast that prophetically point to Gentiles being in the kingdom of God. So there is the Holy Spirit that is given. And this opens up the path for all, both Jew and Gentile, to come into God's kingdom. And so it's interesting. And then, of course, the spring is where the original one happened, the feeding of the 5,000 to a Jewish audience. And the spring is what kicks off 
all of the Jewish feasts, they start in the spring. So there's some subtle things here that are very interesting. Also, the book of Esther, which is a prophetic book speaking to God coming to both Jew and Gentile, is read at the Feast of Pentecost. So there's there's just a lot here that I just want to open up your mind to some deeper things that deserve your deeper attention and future study for. So that hopefully gives us a little bit more of an understanding as to why is Jesus emphasizing this and why is he upset that they're not getting it? What can we learn when we look and compare and contrast the differences of these two different feedings because they are significant? Also, the feeding of the 4,000 happened over three days. What else happened over three days? The sign of Jonah was over three days. Jesus' resurrection and his death and resurrection is over three days. When he resurrected, he paid the sin, paid for the price of sin for the entire world, for all that believe, Jew and Gentile, to come into the kingdom. So some significant differences that are there, but often people just brush off these differences or they don't take the time to look into them a little bit more. Or some even say that they're recounting the same feeding. No, these are two separate instances with significant differences. All right, let's move on. Let's head back over to Matthew 16. All right, now we have Peter calling Christ the Messiah. So verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, this would be in the northern region. This is now into out of Herod's territory into his brother Philip's territory, who is reigning in this area. They're in Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah. <clears throat> Still others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Let's see. I want to read some commentary here. It says, because some people can misinterpret what he's saying here as well. Why, when Jesus says, Peter, on this rock, you will build the church. On this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So it says the rock on which Jesus would build his church has been identified as Jesus himself, his work of salvation by dying for us on the cross. Peter, the first great leader in the church at Jerusalem. And the confession of faith that Peter gave that all subsequent true believers would give. It seems most likely that the rock refers to Peter as the leader of the church for his function, not necessarily his character. Just as Peter had revealed the true identity of Christ, so Jesus revealed Peter's identity and role. Later, Peter reminds Christians that they are the church built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus as the cornerstone. That's 1 Peter 2, 4-6. All believers are joined into this church by faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, the same faith that Peter expressed here. Jesus praised Peter for his confession of faith. It is faith like Peter's that is the foundation of Christ's kingdom. We need to remember that on this rock I will build my church. Jesus is the rock. But he is referring to the, to the fact that Peter is going to initiate his ministry after Jesus is gone. But Jesus is the rock. Jesus is the one that has overcome death, that will overcome hell. Jesus is the one. Okay. It's interesting that here he praises Peter because he says, this hasn't been revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. But it's not long after, <laughs> in just the next few verses, that Peter's going to say something else and Jesus is going to condemn him and rebuke him and say, get behind me, Satan. So we can see that God revealed this to Peter, not out of his own understanding because he's going to get it wrong in just another few verses. 
Verse 21, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So he's saying that some that are there, some of the disciples there are going to see a glimpse into this kingdom, this kingdom of heaven, this kingdom where Jesus is going to reign, where he is going to be in his glory. This is going to be scholars debate whether this is at the transfiguration or if this is seeing him after the resurrection. Either way, they have seen him now overcome death. At the end of the resurrection, after the resurrection, they will see him again and he will have overcome death. On the Mount of Transfiguration that is later to happen, it is going to be Peter, James, and John, and they are going to see him transfigured with Moses and Elijah. They will see what he truly is in his glory. So there's multiple ways that scholars believe that that statement will come to pass. So first Peter says that you're the Christ, you're the son of God. And he's like, God revealed that to you. The father revealed that to you. And then just a few sentences later, we don't know how much time might have passed, whether it was the same day or it was a few days later, but now Peter is going to rebuke him for saying that he was going to die, that he had to go to Jerusalem and die at the hands of the, the leaders, but he had to, and that's what they didn't get. He had to fulfill his mission as a sacrificial lamb on Passover. He had to do that, and they are not getting it yet. So then he rebukes him and says, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. If we think about how Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, one of those temptations was, "Don't you don't have to do any of this. Just give everything over to me, and I'll give you all these kingdoms of the world. And Satan shows him all these kingdoms of the world and basically says, you don't have to suffer and die. You don't have to go through all that. I'll give you all these kingdoms right here. Just bow down and worship me. And of course, Jesus says, no, he knows why he is here. And he is going to begin. This is the first time now that he is going to begin telling them that he has a greater mission at hand. And he hints to it when it says, take up their cross and follow me. He is going to die on a cross for the sins of the world. And that is certainly not what they have in mind. That's certainly not their perspective at this point. I'm glad this is a nugget for you today, Elsa. That's awesome. So good. So that finishes Matthew 16. Let's see if there's anything else in Mark. And then in Luke, this the scriptures from Luke today, we will have already covered those topics. It was only There was only two short ones anyway. So let's see. Mark 8, the feeding of the 4,000, the 12 and the 7, Jesus predicting his death the first time. Okay. And he adds a few extra um, comments here in Mark chapter 8, verse 34. He called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the son of man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his father's glory with the holy angels. And then after actually chapter nine starts here and he says to them, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. Wow. 
All right, so interesting. And another interesting thing, a small note, which is why I encourage you to watch that YouTube video that I shared with you and to do more study. Because in the Matthew account, he says, Matthew records it as him saying, some of you here will not taste death before you see the kingdom. I believe they said the kingdom of heaven. But now here in Mark, it says before they see the kingdom of God. How is it possible that it could potentially be both? So let me just double check that I didn't get that wrong. Okay, I guess Matthew says, I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Coming in his kingdom versus Mark says coming um, before they see the kingdom of God come with power. So some of these nuances, some of these interesting things people have studied to understand and to pick apart, to help us understand, are they talking about the same thing or are they talking about different things? I encourage you, there is more there than what meets the eye on the surface. So I want to encourage you to look deeper into that. And again, that YouTube video I was encouraging you is Robert Breaker. He is a pastor of the cloudchurch.org and his YouTube video, Kingdom of Heaven versus Kingdom of God. And I put that in the comments for you. Okay, let's look at some of our Bible study questions today. It says, how do you react to the knowledge that you are saved through God's revelation of Jesus Christ to you? You are saved through God's revelation of Jesus Christ to you. Just as God revealed that to Peter, it was not of his own understanding. It was not of the mind of men. God revealed that to him, that Jesus was the Christ. So how are we saved through God's revelation of Christ in us. It is God drawing us to himself that we respond to. So we praise the Lord that he has revealed Jesus to us so that we can receive him, that we can accept and believe. What a blessing that is, that we have taken hold of that opportunity when it was revealed to us. Praise the Lord. What does it look like for you to take up your cross and follow Jesus? I think we have to remember, especially in a society like ours, that even though things can get tough at times, we still have it better than the vast majority of the world. We still have more affluence, more prosperity, more abundance than the vast majority of the world. What a blessing that is but we can get complacent in that. So it says, what does it look like for you to take up your cross to follow Jesus? We often think that something is wrong if times are tough for us because we're not used to it. But what does it look like to take up our cross and follow Christ? It means that we have to be okay being ostracized. We have to be okay being ridiculed, being rejected, just as Christ was. We may not be martyred as Jesus was crucified and as the majority of his disciples were. We don't know. But many are, even today, are being martyred for their faith around the world. Still happening today. What does it look like for us? to take up our cross and to follow him, to deny ourselves. And he says, if you are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, I will be ashamed of you. We do not want Jesus to be ashamed of us. We want the honor. It's like Paul says, I count it all the more joy when I face trials and tribulations of all kinds. Can we see our trials and tribulations with joy? It's challenging for us when we've grown up and lived in such prosperity and abundance. It's difficult for us to deny self. It's difficult for us to take up our cross. What does that mean and look like for each of us? something for us to consider and to pray about today. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that you have drawn us to yourself. 
thank you, God, that we have had the opportunity to say yes to you, that we have put our faith and our belief and trust in your son, Jesus, receiving the free gift of salvation for the sacrifice he made for us. Thank you, God, for your word and for the recounting of these things that have happened that we can relate in so many ways. We can be dull and we can miss the point. We cannot understand what it is we are saying. But we thank you, God, that you understand our human limitations. You understand our human condition. You paid the price for our sin. Nothing is greater than that. We thank you for all you have done. Help us to study and understand your words and your meaning so that we can grow in richness of knowing who you are on a deeper level until we meet you face to face. Thank you for your love and your compassion. We thank you for all you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now tomorrow is going to be Matthew 17, Mark 7, and then Luke 9, 28 through 62. So just a heads up for you. So great seeing you ladies here today. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate that. It's wonderful to do this together. And I hope that those resources are helpful for you to help us understand some of these things on a deeper level, but much of this needs our own additional digging and study. That is the joy that we have to be students of God's word and always wanting to learn and understand more, not blindly trusting what I say or what anyone else says, but seeking the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us into deeper understanding. And what a blessing it is for us to have so many resources at our fingertips to be able to do that. So I encourage you in that. So Matthew 17, Mark 9, and Luke 9, part of Luke 9 tomorrow. Have a great rest of your day, ladies. I'll see you later. Bye. Thanks for listening. Want to dive deeper on your own? Pick up your copy of the Eden to Eternity Chronological Bible Study by The Daily Grace Company. Order yours today at fitplusfaith.com slash dailygraceco. That's fitplusfaith.com slash dailygraceco. They're perfect for all your Bible study needs. Have a great day, and we'll catch you on the next episode.